Hello, and welcome to the COVID-19 Legal Info for LGBTQI2S Communities, a webinar series presented by EGAL Canada. EGAL is a national advocacy organization for LGBTQI2S people and their communities. EGAL improves lives through research, education, awareness, and legal advocacy. This is episode three. And we are with the East Coast, specifically Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, and Newfoundland and Labrador. My name is Githanjali Lena, and I use pronouns they and them. So this is the uh, legal information webinar where we move, we're moving across the country doing regional webinars that focus on housing and employment and the impacts of COVID and the pandemic on existing systems uh, and communities and people across the country. And I'll give you a little snapshot about what's happening in the Atlantic provinces before we meet our incredible set of guests. In the post-winter holiday frenzy of new COVID-19 cases, as of mid-January, the East Coast was still faring a lot better than the rest of the country. These four provinces were seeing low numbers of active cases ranging from as low as 29 in Nova Scotia. The exception in January was New Brunswick, which was experiencing an outbreak of about 300 active cases. For comparison, in mid-January in Quebec, there were roughly 20,000 active cases. The Atlantic bubble, as it's called, was a thing for several months, and the subsequently closed borders helped a lot. However, the loss of over 170,000 seasonal tourism jobs last year hit the economy very hard. And then the shrinking of the global indoor dining room in restaurants around the world impacted the fishing industry as the demand for fresh seafood dropped. But tourism within the bubble helped keep bars and restaurants open between the four provinces. The pandemic is always evolving, however. So March 1st brought PEI to red alert levels with new public health place measures in place. And after keeping num numbers extremely low, Newfoundland had a COVID outbreak in St. John's in early February, resulting in some 565 cases linked to that outbreak and the B117 variant. This spread rapidly amongst teenagers who showed mild to no symptoms. And now in Nova Scotia, theaters and restaurants have been shut down amid very new COVID restrictions. So there is an ebb and a flow to the restrictions caused by the pandemic across the region. And without but the bubble, provinces maintain some interprovincial travel restrictions. Our speakers will do a much better job at explaining these details than I will. So let's get into it. Today, our panel features David McQuillan of PEI, Doug Hill of Nova Scotia, and Jude Benoit from Newfoundland. Let's start with David. David is the tenant support worker with Community Legal Information in Charlottetown, PEI. David supports tenants by providing direct client service, creating plain language legal information resources, and delivering legal information workshops for tenants. Hi, David. Hi. Thank, thank you for you having so, me. Thank you so much for joining us. Um. And thank you to everyone for for being here um, and participating in in this in this uh, uh, panel. Um, I'm coming to you from Epequit, the uh, unceded ancestral territory of the Mi'kmaq, who have lived here since time immemorial. Um, and as Gitanjali said, um, I, my name is David McQuillan. I'm the tenant support worker at Community Legal Information, um, which means that I'm responsible for running the Tenant Support Center which is a project funded by the PEI government's Department of Social Development and Housing. As the tenant support worker, I'm responsible for creating free plain language legal information resources like the renting on PEI publication, uh, which we recently just launched in French as well as English, um, for creating free uh, plain language legal information workshops and for running our website rentingpei.ca. I also offer direct client service to tenants and landlords on PEI. Um, I'm not a lawyer, so the support that I offer is strictly legal information, not advice. Um, I think I have that in common with Egal. Um, our goal at CLE is to maximize public access to justice. 
And since I offer legal information to clients, most of whom are tenants, I can speak a little bit about the legal issues facing tenants on PEI and how the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted those issues in, in my experience. So I'll start by talking a little bit about um, kind of a summary of the COVID adaptations here on PEI and supports offered by the government, uh, the impact that I've seen on tenants and, uh, and clients, um, barriers to uh, potential barriers to justice in our rental system that I've uh, identified. And then I'll talk a bit about the rent control system on PEI, a cool new project that someone is doing here, um, and the, the uh, new legislation that we have coming. Um, so initially, whenever the COVID-19 pandemic hit uh, PEI last year, there was a, a pretty strict lockdown. Visitors were required to isolate for 14 days upon arrival, as we all know. Um, there were legal implications if people broke their quarantine. Penalties for that included fines and potentially arrest or jail time, although I think, to my knowledge, only one person was ever jailed for that on PEI. Uh, but a number of fines were issued. PEI experienced very few cases early on and announced a multi-step recovery plan between April and July. Uh, beginning with a pretty thorough lockdown, the steps gradually eased restrictions by allowing larger private gatherings, more restaurant and retail activities, and so on. Uh, the Chief Public Health Office um, and the provincial government followed this plan closely, and things went more or less according to plan. And uh, early in the summer, they announced that they were talking about creating an Atlantic bubble with PEI, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, and Newfoundland. Um, and that was that opened on July 3rd of 2020. And that lasted until it was temporarily suspended on November 25th of 2020 when there was an outbreak. Um, the bubble still remains in a state of temporary suspension. There have been a few different iterations since the end of November, but the current status is that uh, Newfoundland and Labrador is closed to all residents, um, or all residents must, must self-isolate for 14 days upon arrival. Um, that's all residents of, of Atlantic provinces. The same is true of PEI, and the same is true of New Brunswick as well. But Nova Scotia is still open to residents of PEI. Um, so if you're coming from PEI to Nova Scotia, you don't have to isolate for 14 days. And that's the case today. But as we've, we've mentioned, things are changing very quickly and they're changing all the time. Um, for some housing specific things that the government introduced, uh, in April of 2020, the rental office, which is kind of a rental board, they oversee all disputes between tenants and landlords. Um, it's part of our Re Island Regulatory and Appeals Commission. They took action. Uh, they introduced a de facto moratorium on evictions by suspending all non-emergency hearings. Um, and that included evictions. So the government then formalized this moratorium um, and announced that that would be in place for the foreseeable future. But it was lifted in June. Um, there was no suspension of rent or rent forgiveness during this time. Uh, landlords could still issue evictions, but no one would enforce them. Tenants who struggled to pay rent during this time uh, were then would owe landlords arrears. Um, and since June, the rental office has been holding hearings by, by phone, uh, on conference call, and evictions have been proceeding as normal. May uh, I ask, do you yeah. notice a spike in evictions as a result of arrears accumulated during the pandemic? It's actually interesting. Um, for the first time, the rental office has released some stats on evictions and uh, one of the leading stats every year, if you look back at the, at the past few years, um, one of the leading stats for delivery of possession, which is the word they use for the enforcement of an eviction. Right. Um, one of the leading causes is non-payment of rent. Um, and that still remains one of the leading causes, but it's actually gone down in 2020. Um, and evictions overall, uh, have gone down in 2020. Um, mm -hmm. so it is interesting, um, if I were to speculate, I would say probably because of some of the robust uh, financial supports offered by the federal government during that time. Um, there are a lot of seasonal workers on PEI and, and uh, people who might not be used to having as much income come through as as, uh, as the CERB offered during that time. So right. some people actually saw their income go up during that time. Um, so... The provincial government also offered $500 payments to support workers uh, during the early stages of the pandemic and also during the temporary lockdowns that we've had since, which they've called circuit breakers. We're in the middle of the second one now, and they've just announced this, this uh, funding again, $500 for people who have lost work. 
due to the lockdown. Um, so that's a little bit about what the government has done. But COVID-19 has had a major impact on tenants that's difficult to quantify. Um, everyone is spending more time indoors, which puts a lot of strain on interpersonal relationships like couples and roommates and everything and, and mental health. Um, it also, I've found, I, intensifies the impact of environmental health problems like mold or pests and so on. Mm -hmm. um, we've seen more complaints along the lines of env environmental health concerns in the past few months than we're used to seeing. Um, and it's it's one of the, the most common issues that we hear about right now. Um, and as as I've mentioned, many tenants have lost work or experienced a loss of income, but, it, but those financial supports have come in. Um, so we haven't seen a spike. Uh, we've actually seen a reduction in evictions due to um, non-payment of rent. Uh, there's, there's also a new problem caused by COVID-19 uh, in that there are renters arriving to PEI. And this is probably the case for other Atlantic provinces from out of province, signing fixed term leases and paying their security deposit and first month's rent before visiting their unit in person um, because they do require a place to quarantine for two weeks immediately upon arrival. Right. Um, some of these tenants claim that the rental units are not in the condition that was advertised. Some have found the units unsuitable for habitation. And this has led tenants to try to end rental agreements early only to find sometimes that they're stuck in an agreement for an entire year or that it's difficult to, to leave that agreement. Um, in general, so then the, the public health situation has compounded existing stresses and created new challenges for many tenants. Uh, in, in my work, I do not collect any demographic data or ask clients to self-identify, so I can't comment specifically on the impact on the island's LGBTQI2SA uh, plus community. Um, but we do know that, that people who belong to, to this community or other marginalized communities um, experience, uh, often experience greater challenges navigating institutions for a variety of reasons. Um, so I'll talk a bit about how the, the rental office works. So again, they're the rent, they, over, they oversee um, disputes between tenants and landlords on PEI. Right. Um, the rental office uses a complaint-based hearing system that requires the tenants know their rights, acquire and fill out forms, attend hearings, collect and present evidence, um, undergo a lot of scrutiny sometimes in their personal lives, and meet deadlines for appeals. This so process, the tenant, so, the tenant themselves has to initiate the complaint. Uh, generally, yeah. Okay. Uh, the process can often involve a significant investment of time and energy. It can be invasive. It can require tenants to self-identify, put them themselves in potentially vulnerable positions, or put their private relationships under scrutiny. Right. Um, people struggling to make ends meet or dealing with other stressful issues in their lives. Um, might not have the time or energy readily available to navigate this process. Uh, tenants who are not informed of their rights or who do not act immediately when a problem comes up can sometimes face, uh, can sometimes risk inadequate housing, illegal rent increases, or unlawful evictions. Um, similar challenges factor into many other kinds of legal problems as well. Um, our goal, again, is to make this uh, information and access to justice as accessible as possible. Um, and so, uh, one other thing I'd like to talk about is um, whenever there's a, a low vacancy rate, as there is on PEI and there has been for years, um, there is room for personal biases and prejudices. Um, Do you mind explaining what the vacancy rate actually refers to? I think it might be helpful to explain that. Absolutely. So a vacancy rate, uh, that refers to um, available housing, basically. Um, so the CMHC, the... Um, they uh, they define a, a, a healthy vacancy rate as somewhere between three and five percent of units vacant on, in an area. Right. Um, and PEI has had um, has been dealing with a with a, a housing crisis for a while, which means that they're below that that threshold. Um, it's getting better. It's getting much better. Um, so when, one thing that happens whenever that's the case is uh, we we have legislation on PEI. Um, it's the residential, the Rental of Residential Property Act, and it makes reference to the PEI Human Rights Act in saying that landlords cannot discriminate based on race, age, sexual orientation, gender identity, disability, um, or other protected identities. Uh, this can be hard to track when there's a low vacancy rate. If each unit has uh, multiple applicants, there's no oversight into the landlord's decision to choose right. one tenant over another. Um, and so I just like to mention for anyone listening, if, if they're living on PEI, any complaints about potential discrimination or human rights violations should go through the PEI Human Rights Commission. 
Um, even if you suspect that there's been a violation and you're not sure, you can call the Human Rights Commission and, and they can help you navigate that process. And I was wondering if there are, like, what is the situation in PEI when um, a landlord has a vacant apartment, can they jack up the rent? That's a great question. Um, so that's called vacancy control. That's right. Yeah. And we're pretty unique in, in, uh, in having vacancy control, at least in Canada. Um, so one, whenever I was going to talk about barriers, one of them is information. Um, and that really applies access to information, but that applies to our rent control system. So the, we have a vacancy control system, which means that rent runs with the unit and it cannot be increased beyond the rent control guidelines between tenancies. Um, even if the landlord changes, you, you can't increase the rent. So that's for, amazing. For 2021, the, the maximum rent increase for an apartment on PEI is 1%. Um, and landlords can do that once per year. So, so that should answer Melvin's question. We see you, Melvin. So thanks for that question. Thanks, David. Thank um, enforcing this requires the tenants report illegal rent increases when they see them. Um, which requires knowing how much rent was paid and when. Uh, and that can be a really difficult thing to know. Uh, so someone on PEI named Darcy Lanthier, she has recently created an initiative called My Old Apartment. Um, and she's created mailable cards that allow tenants and former tenants to reach out to the current tenants occupying properties that they used to rent and tell them how much they paid and when. So with that information, a tenant can then uh, complain about an illegal rent increase. But again, it, it does have to be initiated by the tenant. Um, Has anyone done that and gotten money back? I don't think there are any cases that have gone through yet, but there's a lot of activity. People are talking about um, talking about filing these things. Yeah. Um, but you'd have to ask Darcy about that. I'm, I'm not entirely sure whether anything has been successful yet. Um, Okay. And so that, that leads me to, do I have some time left or am I? You have I a time? short amount of time left. So I would say share with us your next best point. Okay. <laughs> this already, but yes, we sure only thing. 60 minutes. Um, okay. So the final thing I'd like to mention is that one direct impact of COVID-19 on rental law and PEI has been that um, a, a replacement legislation. So our current legislation has been in place since 1988 and is due to be replaced by new legislation. Uh, last year, the government released a draft Residential Tenancy Act, which was to replace the existing act, um, and began a public consultation in March. The first consultation, which we participated in, happened the same week that the province shut down. The public consultation process has been suspended and the new legislation has been delayed until at least the fall of 2021. But it does change the rental law quite a bit and brings in a lot of new protections for tenants. Um, there will be a likely another round of public consultation, but nothing concrete has been announced yet. For anyone living on PEI who's interested in this, um, it's uh, it's something you can definitely get involved in once that begins. Um, David, I do see a question from Susan Rose that says, I believe this is for you. Can the Human Rights Commission address the issue in a timely manner? I believe like human rights issues that come up with respect to discrimination in housing. And they said that in Newfoundland, our human rights agency is underfunded. That is from Susan Rose. Thanks, Susan. That's a good question. And uh, I'm afraid I don't have a good answer. Um, we do often refer to the Human Rights Commission. Um, we, In my position, I don't do a whole lot of follow-up once I refer to them. So I'm, I'm not entirely sure how long the process takes. Um, or and I, and I can't really comment on, on their funding or anything. But... Um, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry that I don't have a better answer for, than that, but um, I haven't gone through the process myself and, and I'm not quite familiar with it. Um, perhaps, Susan, if you're interested in human rights situation in Prince Edward Island, you can get in touch with Tom Hilton, who works in discrimination, well, like works to address discrimination um, through his work at the uh, PEI Human Rights Commission. And we can post his name in the chat. I will try to do that. And thank you so much, David. Thank uh, you for listening. That, yeah, that was really interesting. And we'll come back to you after we hear from our next guest who is coming to us from Halifax. I am gonna introduce Doug Hill. 
going by pronouns he, him, has been a grievance and adjudication officer for 17 years in the representation and legal services branch of the Public Service Alliance of Canada, PSAC. He represents PSAC members across Canada before arbitration and adjudication tribunals for their grievances and human rights complaints. Welcome, Doug. Hi, thank you very much for having me. First, I'd like to recognize the fact that I'm seated here in Nova Scotia on uh, historical Mi'kmaq territory. And it's a pleasure to sit and talk about this very important issue. Um, and I just want to segue into David's comments about the Residential Tenancy Act and the fact that um, the rights that he referred to are prohibited ground rights that are found under the Canadian Charter of Rights Act, <clears throat> the Canadian Human Rights Act, and in my job as a grievance and adjudication officer is to represent people at their adjudication hearings and to resolve their human rights complaints. Um, the prohibited grounds of uh, various forms of discrimination are race, sex, sexual orientation, disability, mental disability, as David said. The Residential Tenancy Act, Act has these prohibited grounds in their act as well as federal government employees have these prohibited grounds within their collective agreement. Um, so when someone's rights are discriminated <clears throat> against, there are certain recourse mechanisms that they have. They can file a grievance, they can file a human rights complaint. That's for federal employees. But what about the workers here in Nova Scotia that um, are not unionized? Exactly. What, are their, what are their recourse mechanisms? Right, so they could uh, still make a human rights complaint. They can still make a human rights complaint as well. They can also file a complaint with the Nova Scotia Labor Review Board right. uh, to deal with their specific issues. And they're, you know, they're, they're administrative processes. To answer the last question, how long does a human rights complaint actually take? Mm. Um, I can tell you that there's a that you know there's an increasing backlog with respect to the grievances on issues of um, discrimination on various prohibited grounds. One one decision that I argued recently, uh, Christian Reeves' decision that dealt with the issue of discrimination on the prohibited ground of race out of Halifax. His employer was D and D, one of the largest federal employers in the country. Is that uh, the defense ministry? Yes, the the National Department defense. of National Defense, D and D, right, Department. Of national defense and um you know at the end of the day when christian was reinstated he received five years back pay so that may give you an indication on how long from date a to date b some of these processes will take now in filing a grievance you do have time limits usually within 25 days and filing a human rights complaint there are also time limits associated with that and that's usually a one-year time limit from the time of the incident so if someone has been discriminated against um, by their landlord, as David indicated, they have a one year time limit to file, um, to file a, a human rights complaint. So, but- is that, you know, is that something that, would you consider that to be a barrier, Doug, for people who, let's say, have racial trauma or have uh, trauma around transphobia, uh, homophobia. I know as a lawyer, I, I met many people who came to me after that year had passed because we have the same mm -hmm. one year time limitation in Ontario from the, from the date of the incident or the last incident. And uh, there were ways in Ontario to be able to ask for an extension of time. Does that, is that possible in circumstances uh, for? Yeah, there, there, there are circumstances in which time limits can be extended um, and but you must establish um, clear compelling uh, reasons for an extension for example um, someone <clears throat> loses their job um, and is discriminated because because of their sexual orientation and they're very traumatized and they jump in their car after being terminated and uh, unfortunately end up into a car accident and perhaps hospitalized for a period of time in the meantime the time limits continue to go on with respect to a grievance, perhaps we're in the hospital for two months. So the grievance time limits have expired of 25 days, but under certain circumstances, those time limits can be um, extended. But once again, there has to be compelling reasons. Um, you can't 
sit on your rights um, to file a grievance and then decide to do it a year later. There's usually 25 days. The same thing applies for the Human Rights Commission. Um, they give uh, a one-year time limit right, to file your human rights complaint and from the time of the incident. So um, perhaps with the short time of filing a grievance, this 25 days could be a barrier. But the fact that the Human Rights Commission um, allows for one year uh, is certainly more lenient time. Um, I mean, so I would say more lenient, but still, given the significant amounts of trauma that LGBTQI2S people and lots of racialized people experience, I, I do support those initiatives that are calling for in certain groups of cases for marginalized uh, human rights claimants that they're that they waive the that they waive that. But we don't need to belabor that point. I just want no, to I, no, and I mean, quite often, as you said, people are traumatized. And it's not until they actually unpack exactly what has happened to them and realize perhaps the, the, the intersectionality as to why they yeah. in fact were terminated. Um, there's you know microaggressions that may have occurred in their workforce. Uh, things may come to light later down the line. Uh, they may perhaps through an access to information discover that there's email exchanges between the supervisors that, right. that made homophobic um, homophobic uh, uh, slurs behind the person's back. So Doug, you just mentioned two super important things. I just want to make sure that everyone's getting this. So can you explain what a microaggression is as opposed to, I don't know, a violent attack? Because that's really relevant in the workplace, right? Microaggressions, yeah. Thank you. Are usually passive aggressive behavior of undermining a person's integrity, undermining a person's ability to do their job, referring to um, referring to a black man as being lazy is seen as a microaggression, right? Um, um, referring to, to um, trans, <clears throat> queer uh, people um, in a manner that is not, I mean, there's overt discrimination and there's covert discrimination. Uh, there's passive aggressive behavior, um, rolling your eyes towards somebody because of the, the way they walk or um, seeing two men hold hands um, and, you know, your body language changes and um, you shake your head. The, all of those are actions of microaggressions towards somebody that when they take place in the work environment are considered to be discriminatory and are examples and evidence of discriminatory. Thank They're you. sometimes like the air that we breathe, right? You can't necessarily see it, but you can feel it. Right. You can feel when somebody doesn't like you. When You can feel when somebody um, disagrees with your sexual orientation. That's why it is actually in the, the Canadian Human Rights Act. That's why it's in the collective agreement. That's why it's part of the Residential Tenancy Act because it is a prohibited ground of discrimination. Now you have the burden. To prove it. Right? You have the burden to prove it, right? And that burden is done on, a, on the civil standard. It's called the balance of probabilities to prove right. that. And one of the things that I wanted to dig into um, has to do with uh, the Reeves decision and the Marilyn Duro decision. And in doing this job for 17 years, I've represented a number of people on various human rights complaints, on various prohibited grounds. I've represented somebody with respect to discrimination based on religion, right. discrimination based on family status, discrimination based on sex, the leading case right now in the Federal Public Sector Labor Relations and Employment Board is the Christian Reeves decision, which is discrimination based on race and ethnic origin. The leading case right now with respect to sexual harassment in the workplace, I represented Marilyn Duro out of Hamilton, Ontario. Her employer was CRA. There were 13 allegations of sexual harassment against her, all of which were founded. Um, <clears throat> and uh, by her I'm just wondering, Doug, if you could mention what kind of, uh, I don't know if these are, if you can 
if this is public information, but can this you is, this well, is, can Yes, this is public information. These decisions are public decisions, absolutely. And that's why we can talk about them. Anyone can go on the Federal Public Sector Labor Relations and Employment Board website. That is the Federal Public Sector Labor Relations and Employment Board website. Right. You go on that website and you enter the name Christian Reeves, his decision will come up. It's a public decision. If you enter the name Marilyn Duro, D-O-R-O, this decision will come up. And these, in these decisions, they have, um, they have, it's been founded that there were findings of discrimination. And as a result, the adjudicator awarded damages under the Canadian Human Rights Act. In the Marilyn Duro decision, the damages reached the maximum, as well as reinstating them. So these are the recourse mechanisms that people have when they are discriminated against. Because they're federal employees, they filed human rights complaints with the Canadian Human Rights Commission. In, no in Nova Scotia, you can file complaints with the Nova Scotia Human Rights Commission. But the point I was going to make is that in, in, in having represented people with these various prohibited grounds, in my 17 years, sadly, I am yet to, to argue or to represent someone who has been discriminated against because of sexual orientation. And I remember after 10 years, I said to myself, you know, I'm yet to argue against a case with someone to deal with racial discrimination. And like racial discrimination and sexual orientation, quite often there are barriers in place that prevents people from actually filing these complaints. So Ted, tell us what some of those barriers might be. And we do have to move to our next guest shortly, but I would love to hear what some of the barriers are to actually making those complaints because we know the discrimination is happening against queer absolutely the discrimination is happening you know no. as david indicated as david indicated some people have to self identify with respect to the sexual orientation right. in the workplace right um, that's those those are those are barriers those are personal choices right um, compared to the prohibited ground of being a black person when you walk into the room, everybody knows that you're prohibited ground. But with respect to your sexual orientation, and you know, and from a human resources standpoint, is that when you go to check off a box as to who your beneficiary is, and you know, a man checking off a box saying is he married, checks it off as married, your beneficiary, and you put a male's name. Those are barriers because of your sexual orientation. Those are the types of barriers. Now you're talking about actually filling out a complaint form. Right. right, Which actually outlines all of the circumstances, which is private to you, but has been oppressive because of your sexual orientation. Those all become barriers. And that's one of the reasons, as well as the transmitting of these complaints, either if it's a grievance or someone within that process to take it to the next level, perhaps doesn't feel that your complaint has merit, right? And yeah. so it doesn't it doesn't pass that test, right? The person doesn't have the 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 um, the equity lens that's required to do the analysis to see that there is a form of discrimination based upon the prohibited grounds of sexual orientation. That's one of the bigger barriers as to why these. Right. Or the decision maker. Right. These decision makers are usually older white men who are right? most likely straight that are most likely straight. Yeah. Yes. That's the point I was trying to make. So. Um, so what and I realize and my time is limited. Is time. That Go ahead. There is most just the reason why we say that is not just because we're trying to say that. Um, I think to clarify why that matters about the identity of the adjudicators at human rights commissions and before um, grievance panels and adjudication is be, is that they are mo much more likely to have bias, unconscious bias, stereotypes, and yes. not be able to relate to the experiences of the people who are bringing these complaints. Absolutely. Right? So Absolutely. I'm going to, Doug, I'm going to ask you one more question before we have to move on to our next illustrious guest. And the question is, if you are not unionized, right? So you don't have a collective agreement. You can't make a, you can't file a grievance about something that's happening at work. Let's say about 
unsafe work conditions, not being provided personal protective equipment or having paid sick days. Talk to us about that. If you're not union, if, you're, if you're not a unionized worker, and this is a big issue in Nova Scotia, where um, <clears throat> the, the province of Nova Scotia is yet to pass um, legislation around sick leave. So a lot of people that are not unionized that don't have um, sick leave in their collective agreement actually lose salary when they decide to take time off of work because of sick, right? But if you're not unionized, what mechanisms do you have? You have the Provincial Human Rights Commission. You can still file your human rights complaints. You still have the Nova Scotia Labor Review Board. You can file complaints with those two um, organizations, which are the leading uh, organizations in Nova Scotia with respect to people's workers' rights. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. And right. um, I want to give a shout out to PEI who like Quebec is one of the few provinces that have legislated paid sick days, but a bit of a caveat there is, um, as David and I were talking about earlier, the PEI legislated sick paid sick days, uh, you can only activate those or access them if you've been working in the same place for five years. Mm. So we know that that is benefiting a particular kind of worker who has a more middle-class job, uh, not minimum wage, less likely to be racialized. Uh, right. So right. I think that's important to be said. Well, thank you so much, Doug. And we will bring you back at the end when we answer questions from the audience and let us hear from our final guest. Our final guest is Jude Benoit, using pronouns they and them, is a proud Mi'kmaq two-spirit person. They are a barista and an artist. Jude is from Tabagook, Newfoundland, currently living in St. John's as an urban native. They work at the Quadrangle as a project coordinator. The Quadrangle or the Quad is a community center for 2S LGBTQIA plus individuals and organizations. Jude also co-founded the 2S LGBTQIA plus Neighboring Pod, which is a grassroots mutual aid group for the queer community. Through the pandemic, Jude has been part of several projects with a focus on food security and access to mental health supports. Hi, Jude. Hi. Hi. I'm very happy to be here. <laughs> Thanks for inviting me. Um, I would like to acknowledge that I am also on stolen land um, of Mi'kmaq and ancestral the Biafic people. And we are all on stolen land uh, in North America. And um, I would like to also add um, that people consider what these land acknowledgements mean as a Mi'kmaq person and what comes after the land acknowledgement. Like an actual act where we do something. <laughs> like an actual act, yes. Thank um, you so much for saying that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay. <laughs> I'm going over my head. I'm like, legal stuff uh, is not really... I think what I need to acknowledge is that a lot of the resources that I'm hoping to bring up today are just Band-Aid um, fixes. They're really beautiful and heartwarming acts of communities coming together and building resources to take care of their own. Mm -hmm. And I love that. But it is just a band-aid to larger systemic uh, issues that we have. And would you say these larger systemic issues like existed before the pandemic? Yes, absolutely. Um, when I was looking into uh, for this panel, what to bring up about our uh, housing situation in Newfoundland and homelessness, I realized that, you know, COVID has put a lot of really unfortunate and difficult barriers in place, but those barriers unfortunately already exist. Yeah. Um, we are, I don't know how many provinces uh, do not have a specific 2S LGBTQ shelter, um, but I know that a lot of them do. And unfortunately we are not one of them. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to things like homelessness, which we know in Newfoundland, a large chunk of our homeless youth population are 2S LGBTQ. Um, so what does that what does that look like in terms of accessing housing? Um, we Are know that. Would you sorry. say I'm just one? Sorry, I don't mean to interrupt you, but I just want to ask: Are they 
visible as homeless people or is it like what some people refer to as like hidden homelessness? How would you describe it f for the youth that you're talking about, Two-Spirit Youth? Absolutely. I am considered, I guess, an older youth, but in my younger youth days, I also unfortunately experienced homelessness uh, in Newfoundland and Labrador. And um, just like COVID, where we're seeing kind of like an ebb and flow, like you said, about like numbers and things always changing, um, you know, like Newfoundland has um, a lot of policies and they've done a lot of really good work at trying to um, make the existing shelters and institutions that they already have um, in the last few years. We've seen a lot of shelters come out and try to do the work of making it more uh, accessible. Mm -hmm. But fortunately, those are not my experiences and they're not the experiences of most youth. We do have a um, heavy couch surfing youth population um, and different um, structures like that. So in Newfoundland, um, and especially here today with the snowstorm that we just had, unfortunately, you know, like if you were to live outdoors, and a lot of people do, we see temporary structures and shelters, especially in northern and rural locations. But in yeah. the city, what we're seeing a lot of is uh, this type of invisible homelessness. So people may think when they walk downtown, well, you know, we don't have the same homeless population, although we do have uh, quite a few panhandlers, we might not have um, a visible homelessness population like you would see in, say, downtown Vancouver, but it definitely is there. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I wanted to talk about some of the resources that we created during COVID. Um, so the mutual aid uh, groups that we have, we have quite a few of them. And um, we almost kind of like we were preparing for COVID. We had directly before it, we had something that we refer to in Newfoundland as Snowmageddon, which uh, <laughs> shut down um, everything for about a week. And um, through that, uh, Newfoundlanders came out in their um, very Newfoundland, <laughs> taking care of our own spirits and put together a lot of different mutual aid groups surrounded by, you know, like if your senior uh, neighbor needs their shovel, uh, needs their driveway shoveled or if um, someone needs groceries or someone needs medication and um, from that stemmed in COVID having a very specific uh, 2S LGBTQ mutual aid group um, and we are able to provide some small reliefs around um, food security so we have a form you can go uh, you can email us or you can go online and find the form to fill out and receive. Um, right now we're doing gift cards and e-transfers just because of the alert level five uh, shutdown. Sometimes right. uh, we also do food hampers, um, but people can really come out and say, you know, like I have uh, clothes and then someone can say, I would like those clothes. And that's kind of like, so it's like an open board of, um, you know, need something, got something kind of thing, but it also has the added benefit of us always posting resources. Um, one of these resources that I would like to bring up is the warm line that was recently created um, by, uh, I believe, Planned Parenthood in Newfoundland and Labrador. <laughs> I hope I'm getting that right. If I'm forgetting any other groups that, that came in to uh, make that happen, I apologize. Um, but the warm line really is a great line ran by uh, trained volunteers who are mostly um, 2S LGBTQ themselves. Mm. And you can call or text the line. Um, I believe there's also an email, uh, but like I'm not sure if Brian is. Um, and like peer sorry, I was just saying it's like peer support. Yes, absolutely. And right now, I think one of the biggest struggles that I've seen during COVID, um, because times are so isolating, and because uh, the queer community here mainly relies on help from the community. Mm -hmm. And um, when you have a community that isn't able to come together, you're seeing a lot of um, barriers, more barriers to mental health. And our institutional mental health system here is, is not very, um, it's not set up to help our queer community in a lot of ways, our marginalized populations. So, to have something that exists like a peer line um, is is beautiful. And I have heard time and time again throughout the pandemic that the warm line has helped a lot of people in a lot of ways. 
Amazing. Yeah. I mean, when I was talking to people um, in Newfoundland in my quest to find you, I <laughs> heard from a lot of people who were talking about services that they provided to survivors of violence, um, different kind of services where they said, you know, we don't hear from queer and trans and two-spirit people, or they're not identifying themselves as such. And um, these are people who were really concerned about that being a gap, there must be barriers because otherwise there would not be that gap. Because we know that queer and trans and two spirit young people and adults experience more violence across the country than anyone else, right? Yeah, I believe just based on personal experience and the different projects and resources that I've helped set up throughout the years, that people really aren't that comfortable. Um, reaching out to groups that aren't specifically made for them. So for um, organizations, if we had say A2S LGBTQ homeless shelter, or if the organization I work for now, Quadrangle had a physical building that they could provide services, that would really help our community because they would feel safe access, access, accessing those services. Um, whereas right now I get a lot of people, if they need legal aid, if they need anything, then they'll go through me or they'll go through somebody else in the community and ask for their support and ask them to help them find out info because they're afraid of self-identifying as a trans person, as a queer person, yeah. as a two-spirit person, as an indigenous person, um, because we unfortunately um, have not had <laughs> any resources uh, for 2S LGBTQ people here. Um, for a really long time. And then when those did exist, we had extra barriers to specifically the trans community where trans specific resources didn't exist here until about 10 years ago. Um, and that again was created by community, it was created by trans youth themselves. So <laughs> in a way it's kind of um, when you are working in a very small city uh, and you, um, a very small city that a lot of the resources are very heavy in Catholicism, they're very connected to religion, they're very connected to um, a medical field. So that can be really intimidating for some people to access to begin with. Um, but if you are afraid of being judged, then you would probably just not ask. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Um, before we return um, and bring our other two guests back, I wanted to ask you, Jude, did you have any other resources that you wanted to highlight? Yes. Um, so there's another resource that I feel really important to highlight right now because I think that this community of workers has been hit heavily by the pandemic and that is uh, sex workers. So we have a beautiful organization here called um, Safe Harbor Outreach Program, mm -hmm. and they have specifically a um, COVID relief fund um, that you can apply through. Again, like most of our programs, it's through a Google form. You can access through their um, web page. I believe I also have it here. Sorry. You might want to enter it into the comments, or can I put it in the comments for you? Yes, that would be great. Thank you. Um, yeah, they have a COVID relief fund that anyone who's self-identifying as a sex worker or in the past worked as a sex worker can apply um, for uh, some funding for essentials. And I believe that that's a resource that everyone should know about because we think that we don't know sex workers in our lives, but that area is so vast um, that, you know, you never know who is around you. So even if people don't feel safe self-identifying as a sex worker, um, if everyone in the community shared this resource, I think that that would be really, really helpful. Okay. And then it sounds like we have that in the comments. So if anyone's looking for that resource, it should be there. Did you call it safe Harbor? Yes. Harbor Outreach Program, SHOP for Got short. It. Amazing. Okay, so let's uh, bring back Doug and David. And I have a fairly simple question for the three of you. So if you could name, if you could each name one advocacy point that you want people to make noise about, what would it be? Um, mine, mine is quite straightforward, um, is the 
the new legislation on PEI. Um, once once the new uh, public consultation process becomes is, is announced, uh, getting involved in that will help create the the best and most fair legislation that, that we can that we can hope to see. And that is the Residential Tenancies Act. That's the name of the new proposed piece of legislation, correct? It is, yeah. Okay, great. And what's the old one called? The Rental of Residential Property Act. Okay, so that's the one we don't want. Well, it's the one we have now. Um, that's the one you have now, but you want to move to this uh, one. The, the new one introduces a lot of new a lot of new protections for tenants and and uh, yeah I, th I think it would it'll uh, it'll benefit the rental market. Okay, amazing. That is the advocacy tip from PEI. Thank you, David. Uh, Jude, Doug, do you have any points that you want people to make noise about and get in touch with their elected officials or just do amongst their friends, community members? I think in Nova Scotia, what we spoke about earlier was um, passing legislation for sick leave for non-unionized workers. That would um, benefit a lot of families. Yeah, huge. People wouldn't have to go to work sick. Absolutely. Okay, amazing. And how many paid sick days do you think people should get? Um, sick leave is something that's usually accumulated on a monthly basis. Um, for example, in some collective agreements, people are entitled to 1.2 sick days per month, right? So as you, quite often people can go for years without getting sick and therefore accumulate, you know, hundreds of hours of sick leave in their bank. And when something happens to them, they draw on that bank without having to go on unemployment insurance, without having to lose salary. So um, whatever the number is, I mean, the, the studies out there, if you look across the board for this like legislation, normally you look at province to province and see what's already implemented in legislation. And I, that, that is a, that's a reasonable number um, or a reasonable formula, if you will, for accumulating sick leave. Yeah. Thank you. Jude, any thoughts? Yeah, I I really feel strongly about like what I said earlier about how we need more specifically um, to us LGBTQ resources and services that are set, set up um, just for us. And um, I, I, I don't know how to make that happen myself, but I have a feeling that if we keep pushing forward, um, in the community that we will get there someday. I'm hoping for a 2S LGBTQ specific shelter yes. so that um, trans women and trans men and non-binary people and 2S people um, will feel safe accessing uh, homelessness services. Yeah, transitional housing and then affordable long-term permanent housing. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I think those are all really, really important points and I'm also, you know, curious about what you think is going to happen after the pandemic ends. Do you think that some of these groups that have formed, whether it's tenant unions or mutual aid networks or um, different you know, pr outreach projects, are they going to fold? Do you think that we will ultimately have changed in a long permanent way because of this pandemic? Great, great question. Um, I would like to think that, you know, out of, out of darkness, eventually there will be sunshine and, um, you know, with this pandemic, this global pandemic, we've all had to hunker down. Uh, I haven't, I'm coming up on the one year anniversary. I haven't been in my office since March 15th of uh, last year. And here we're coming into the one year anniversary. So in working from home, you know, uh, one of the things that um, that I think is important to, to all people that we touched on is uh, the met mental health aspect. Um, of, of yourself, of your children, of your family members. You know, we've had those days where it's like, I just need to get outside or you've experienced anxiety. And, 
you know, disproportionately, um, you know, uh, with with respect to the layoffs in the restaurant in industry, you know, we can say that, you know, racialized people have been disproportionately affected in aspects. We can also say that that the uh, queer and trans people has been disproportionately impacted by this COVID-19 because of, of the way that the, you know, the world has just shut down. And and while we're shut down, we look around and we realize that there's a, been a disproportional effect on certain people. And as this darkness lifts, we need to, with the sunshine, I think we need to we need to continue to build support systems in place so that that doesn't happen again. Yeah, agreed. Yes, um, I also agree that we need to build things so that we can sustain for the future. Mm -hmm. um, I think that if anything, COVID has um, pointed out that we have huge gaps in our mental health services, in our health services in general, um, in our housing, in everything. And um, one of the good things I think that have come out of this pandemic is that we know that we can make things more accessible. We know that we can work from home. We know that we can have Zoom meetings and that we can have gatherings and support groups that are online, that are over the phone. And I'm really, really hoping that after uh, the pandemic lifts that we can hold on to some of those key things from accessibility um, yes. and that we can remember mm -hmm. the things that we needed during this time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I agree with uh, with what everyone has said so far. It's um, I think that the pandemic has really shone a light on some of the some of the existing inequities that uh, that have been around for a long time. And I think that if we can continue to share to show each other as much care as as um, as many of us have during this pandemic after the after the pandemic is gone, mm -hmm. I think that, that that's an opportunity to create a better future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I think that, um, you know, what I'm seeing is the more governments fail to address the, you know, previous systemic problems, the new exacerbated crises, the more people come up with their own solutions and there is so much more collective action that's happening. And I, I, I really hope that that doesn't um, peter out, but um, thank you so much, Jude and Doug and David, it's been really lovely getting to know you over the course of this last couple of weeks and hearing from you about the work that you're doing in the Atlantic provinces. I hope that um, we get to work together again and continue these conversations. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you. All right. And that's all the time we have today for our East Coast session. Our guests were so interesting and creative and resilient and amazing. And please take a look at EGAL's website so that you can see where we will be uh, in the next few weeks and which provinces we'll be covering. I can tell you that next week, live Tuesday, March 9th at 1 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, we will be in Ontario. And we'll be hearing from some volunteers from Eustacea for Migrant Workers. We'll be hearing from a two-spirit worker from the Ontario HIV AIDS Aboriginal Strategy. And also a legal aid lawyer from a Sudbury Legal Clinic. And perhaps a surprise guest. So remember, stay safe, stay informed, and wear a mask. Thank you. Signing out.